Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to this module. In the previous module, we had discussed some of the key concepts and terms associated with the queer theory. In this module, we will look at the contribution of Gail Rubin. She is a cultural anthropologist and theorist of the politics of gender and sexuality, whose writings have helped shape the trajectory of gender studies since the 1970s. We shall discuss two major essays written by her. The first is her 1975 essay, The Traffic in Women, Notes on the Political Economy of Sex. And the second is her 1984 essay, Thinking Sex, Notes for a Radical Theory of the Politics of Sexuality. We will discuss both essays thoroughly in two modules. Gail Rubin has written on a wide range of subjects, ranging from her ethnographic and historic research on gay male leather fetishists as a part of her PhD dissertation to the politics of homosexuality, pornography, and BDSM, which she considers as a valid form of expression for female sexuality. Instead, as women hating violence like some other feminists, for example, Andrea Dorkin and Susan Griffin. BDSM as a term originated in early 1990s. It is interpreted as a combination of the abbreviations. BD, that is bondage and discipline. DS, that is dominance and submission. And SM is sadism and masochism. BDSM is now used as a catch-all phrase covering a wide range of activities, forms of interpersonal relationships, and distinct subcultures. In addition to her academic work, Rubin has been an important figure in social activism. In 1978, she co-founded SEMOIS, the world's first lesbian SM organization. SM stands for Sexual Minority and remained with the group until it was disbanded in 1983. Rubin had completed her PhD in 1994 in cultural anthropology at the University of Michigan. Her dissertation entitled The Valley of Kings, Leatherman in San Francisco, 1960-1990 is hailed as the most authoritative history of gay men's leather in San Francisco. Rubin had been conducting research on leather culture and history since the late 1970s and has been deeply involved in the preservation of leather archives and artifacts. Her dissertation discusses prominent figures, events, and subcultural trends in the heyday of San Francisco men's leather. Leather subculture denotes practices and styles of dress organized around sexual activities. Wearing leather garments is one way that participants in this culture self-consciously distinguish themselves from mainstream sexual cultures. Many participants associate leather culture with BDSM practices and its many subcultures. For some, it is an erotic fashion that expresses heightened masculinity or the appropriation of sexual power, love of motorcycles and independence, and or engagement in sexual kink or leather fetishism. Leather represents a symbol that distinguishes predominantly homosexual white males who came and stuck together following the end of the Second World War. Since then, it is considered as an expression of SM and leather sex linked with masculinity, rough sex and leather fetishism. Throughout the history of the leather subculture, 
a variety of traditions have been observed most or all are based on military protocols and rituals as time has progressed and bdsm has become more mainstream the traditions of leather have adapted today the leather subculture is one of the many facets to semi organized alternative sexuality though the leather community residents are primarily gay white males it is a pansexual community that includes lesbians bisexuals and transgender individuals ethnic minorities and heterosexuals have also been physically or socially involved but their presence is smaller in number leatherman had blended obvious homosexual habits and work clothing with explicitly masculine behavior within leather communities and subcultures gay bars became a central meeting place an important institution where leather folk like their gay and lesbian counterparts could socialize and interact in gail rubin's analysis of leatherman bars texts and maps were equally essential more genteel gay men gathered at sweater bars lesbians met in feminist book stores rubin's maps reveal that san francisco subcultures used specific places to affirm sexual orientation she found that leather bars were located in working class enclaves near the docks or where maritime trades gravitated the idea that the symbolism of black leather has consistently changed over the course of decades since the second world war is showcased best by joseph bean who remarks that wearing leather in 1959 was to be considered an outsider of a relatively extreme sort but this was less the case in 1969 it was hardly relevant in 1979 and not true to any stigmatized extent in 1989 and it was this constant redefining of leather symbols and the attitudes and clothing styles of dress that made the leather community socially acceptable within the gay community and outside also in the larger general heteronormative society in the next slide we have a rare interview of gail rubin where she talks about the rise and fall of leather community what what would a healthy leather scene locally needs is capital uh quality control and i think it was it's real space. estate yeah, yeah space space yeah and real estate it's been that's another thing we're talking about uh maybe I should just at the top but, uh, <laughs> but actually the the other big uh process and I, I'll say this at the end of the talk is that South of Market used to be one of the cheapest neighborhoods in the city. Uh this was uh, to use the monopoly uh, uh the monopoly board this was essentially Baltic Avenue. Okay. And Baltic <laughs> Avenue was turning into Park Place. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of uh spaces that leather has managed to use to thrive in major cities has been mostly the Baltic Avenues. It's been industrial labor abandoned, abandoned industrial neighborhoods like this one um the in New York it was the dock strip which was really along the old crumbling piers of of New York uh these were cheap places and as they become replaced by these really massive um uh, uh massive capital intensive developments they they go away and uh that really began uh the big issue the big start in South of Market security region as a leather neighborhood I think started in in 1978 when the ground was broken for the Moscone Center. Wow. Moscone Center then opened in 1981, which was the same year that people started to uh well it was the same year that Tony Tavarosi uh suddenly died of uh, uh, pneumocystis um and was one of the first uh HIV HIV deaths in the in the group of people that I knew at the time who were involved in leather. He had been involved in the leather community for decades. So um it was sort of a perfect storm because AIDS and HIV hit right around the same time that this wave of real estate uh, revaluation started to roll through the state. This video explores the impact of deindustrialization on queer urban location through the case of San Francisco's gay male leather population. 
five decades of relentless urban renewal and large scale redevelopment transformed this formerly industrial and working class residential neighborhood into areas of luxury housing and capital intensive commerce, making it increasingly precarious for gay and leather presence. Rubin became a prominent figure in the sex wars of the late 1970s and 1980s as a sex positive activist, advocating greater permissiveness of sexual variation and also a more nuanced analysis of the ways gender, sexuality and power work together. Various writers associated with the queer theory have put forward arguments for theorizing sexuality independently from gender. Gail Rubin's work has been influential in the development of such arguments. In the early 1980s, she argued that although connected, gender and sexuality are not synonymous with each other. Opposed to the view that sexuality can be adequately understood as causing gender, Rubin offered in a written account of what she termed as a sex gender system in which she separates sexuality and gender. She challenged the basic assumptions about sex, gender and sexuality, including the oppositions between heterosexual and homosexual, biological sex and culturally determined gender and man and woman. Feminists also found it useful to distinguish sex and gender. This enabled them to argue that many differences between women and men were socially produced and therefore changeable. Rubin argued that gender was not the inevitable outcome of biological sex differences and that sexuality is not a consequence of gender as Euro-American thinking had supposed. Instead, she suggested that sexuality is constructed through a system of sexual stratification in which forms of sexuality are differently valued. This differential evaluation creates a hierarchy legitimating some expressions of sexuality such as married heterosexuality while persecuting others such as homosexuality, transsexualism, fetishism and sadomasochism. Rubin argues that this sex gender valuation system is encoded in law, enforced by the state and policed by medical professionals and popular ideas about appropriate and inappropriate sexual behavior. Now we shall discuss Rubin's first major essay entitled The Traffic in Women, Notes on the Political Economy of Sex, which was published in 1975. This essay introduced the concept of historically and geographically varying sex gender systems. It is grounded in Rubin's innovative combination of insights from anthropology and psychoanalysis. The success of the essay catapulted Rubin into the academic limelight at a time when she was a graduate student in anthropology, still at the University of Michigan. In order to explain the foundations of the operations of women in capitalist societies, Rubin brings together the analytical frameworks of Marxist historical materialism, Freudian psychoanalysis, and Levi-Straussian structuralism. In this process, she introduces the concept of the sex gender system. She locates the structural operation of women in the kinship systems that create gender division and compulsory heterosexuality. She begins the essay with a big question that second wave feminists had been trying to resolve in the 1970s. How do we account for women's oppression and social subordination? The essay has had a pervasive impact and continues to influence new generations of feminist thinkers even today. Rubin rejected biologically essentialist sexuality in favor of the social organization of sexuality, imagining 
a utopian elimination of obligatory heterosexuality. And she questions, and I quote from her, What is a domesticated woman, a female of this species? The one explanation is as good as the other. A woman is a woman. She only becomes a domestic, a wife, a chattel, a playboy bunny, a prostitute or a human dictaphone in certain relations. Torn from these relationships, she is no more the helpmate of man than gold in itself is money, and so on. What then are these relationships by which a female becomes an oppressed woman? In order to answer this question, she analyzes the works of Riot and Levi Strauss and offers a detailed account of how systematic social mechanism shapes domesticated women. She tries to find the genesis of sexual inequality in order to form a sexually egalitarian society in future. Friar and Levi Strauss, as Rubin has argued, offer conceptual frameworks for explaining the social structures which allow for the discrimination of women, structures which have been termed by Rubin as the sex gender system. She has employed this system to articulate that part of social life which is the locus of the operation of women, describing gender as the socially imposed division of the sexes. She validates the need for such a concept by discussing the failure of Marxism to fully explain sexual oppression. She believes that Marxism as a theory of social life is relatively unconcerned with sex. Unlike Marx, Friot and Levi Strauss provide a deep understanding of sexuality and emphasize on the profound differences between the social experiences of different genders. The essay follows a strictly social constructionist line and her model of sexual constructivism has instituted paradigms that would come to constitute queer theory's critique of feminism. Let us look at Rubin's critique of Marxism. Marxism locates the operation of women within the capitalist dynamics by pointing to the relationship between housework and the reproduction of labor. Rubin argues that the reproduction of labor power depends on women's housework to transform commodities into sustenance for the worker. The system of capitalism cannot generate surplus without women, yet society does not grant women access to the resulting capital. Rubin argues that explaining why women are essential for capitalism does not account for why they are oppressed by it, noting that women are oppressed in various forms of societies, capitalist as well as those societies which are not necessarily capitalist. She notes that it is precisely at this point that the analysis of capitalism ceases to explain very much about women and their oppression. She also says that analyzing the reproduction of labor power does not explain why women have to take the responsibility of domestic chores instead of men and emphasizes on the historical and moral element which enabled capitalism to present a cultural heritage of divided labor and sexual oppression. She stresses on the exploitation of women even before capitalism came to exist in Europe. Although Marxism acknowledges the oppression of women with the presentation of females as raw materials and fashions domesticated women as products, its argument is that the oppression of women lies entirely within society's capitalist structure. Thus, Rubin argues, if this were the case, a socialist revolution would eliminate the oppression of women. But herein lies the key to Rubin's push for a feminist revolution as opposed to a socialist one. The root of the oppression of women cannot be condensed to merely women's usefulness to the capitalist surplus value. Women oppressed by capitalism 
are a product of the operation of women as a whole and not the origin of it. Reuben also refers to the argument which has been presented by Frederick Engels that societies do not only have to meet their immediate material needs but also the needs of reproducing themselves. Any satisfaction of material needs is achieved by means of a socio-cultural formation which includes the sex gender system which is different for every society. Rubin comments that Engels see sex operation as part of capitalism's heritage from prior social forms and he integrates sex and sexuality into his theory of society. Rubin finds his book The Origin of the Family rather unsatisfying even though she acknowledges that it provides certain insights. Engels has emphasized on the idea that relations of sexuality can be distinguished from the relations of production. Each society according to both Marx and Engels has needs of sexuality and procreation. As a result, each society has a sex gender system defined as a set of arrangements by which the biological raw material of human sex and procreation is shaped by human and social intervention and satisfied in a conventional manner no matter how bizarre some of the conventions may be. The system assists in discrimination, oppression and trafficking of women. According to Rubin, gender identity, sexual desire and fantasy and also the concepts of childhood are all social products. All societies have their own ways of dealing with sex, gender and children and they insist on fulfilling their desires of procreation. Rubin also clarifies that sex gender system goes by several alternate names including mode of reproduction and patriarchy. Unlike most of the radical feminists of the time though, Rubin is rather wary of the term patriarchy. The term was introduced by feminists to distinguish the forces for maintaining sexism from other social forces such as capitalism. Rubin observes that the term capitalism is useful precisely because it distinguishes between different systems of political economy. Rubin also notes that not all countries have capitalist economic systems and she says that the power of the term lies in its implication that in fact there are alternatives to capitalism. Patriarchy however tends to mask the very different ways in which sexual worlds have been organized. And Rubin prefers the term sex gender system because while we can assume that all societies will have some kind of sex gender system in place, this term allows for differences and indicates that operation is not inevitable within that domain but is rather the product of the specific social relations which organizes it. Following Marxism's inability to locate the genesis of operation of women, Rubin continues with an exploration into anthropology, specifically the analysis of kinship systems. The system of yet women are not granted granted any access that historical, that historical patterns of women in capitalist societies. Historical patterns by considering, considering the sex gender, the working of a sex gender system of kinship systems which also serve, also serve to reap sexuality and his analysis of how of biological reproduction. She refers to his work The Elementary Structure of Kinship which was published in 1949. In kinship systems lie a key to understanding what Rubin calls the sex gender system. 
She makes it clear that kinship systems are not formulated out of biology or genetics and borrows this idea from Levis Strauss that they are rather socio-cultural categories and statuses. She further applies Levi Strauss' understanding of the emergence of the incest taboo and his concept of gift to explain the exchange of women in societies. These concepts are employed in order to understand how kinship is related to gender inequality. Levi Strauss had borrowed these ideas from a 1925 essay of the French sociologist Marcel Mauss. The title of this essay is The Gift, Forms and Functions of Exchange in Archaic Societies. It was Mauss who first theorized the significance of one of the most striking features of primitive societies, that is the extent to which giving, receiving and reciprocating gifts dominate social intercourse. Marcel Mauss has theorized that gift giving and gift receiving is the dominating force in social intercourse. It expresses, affirms or creates a social link between the partners of an exchange. Rubin then adds Levi Strauss understanding of the incest taboo in this idea and he states that in a culture in which gift giving is fundamental to social relationships Marriage can be seen as a critical form of gift exchange. In these exchanges, it is women who are the gifts and men who do the exchange. Referencing Marcel Mauss, she argues that women are born biologically female, but they only become gendered when the distinction between male giver and female gift is made within this exchange. For men, giving the gift of a daughter or a sister to another man for the purpose of matrimony allows for the formation of kinship ties between two men. Although both Moss and Levi Strauss emphasize the solidary aspects of gift exchange, the other purposes served by gift giving only strengthen the point that it is a pervasive and universal means of social commerce. Levi Strauss had also suggested that a gift is a basic form for establishing special relations between individuals, families and clans, etc. Marriages, in his opinion, are one of the basic forms of gift exchange and he claims that the taboo on incest is the mechanism which ensures that such trade relation will be performed between families or other units as a means of grounding alliances. The alliances are between men with women serving as the means for establishing them. If one were to marry the women in his family, there would be no gift to exchange. It is this exchange that Rubin refers to as the traffic of women. Women are the gifts that are transferred from one group to the next and thus are the ones who allow the men, the exchangers, to receive social power. Rubin notes that the concept of the exchange of women situates their operation in the realm of society and not biology. She argues that kinship systems do not exchange just women, but also sexual access, genealogical statuses, dynasty names, rights in people, men, women and children. The kinship system, which is tied with the sex gender system, allocates certain rights to men and others to women, and it also denies women the right to choose their own destiny. Women's operation is not the source of social organization, but the product of it. If it is the women who are being transacted, then it is the men who give and take them who benefit from the social exchange. In such a system, women cannot have full rights to themselves. A gift of a woman is more profound than the result of other gift transactions because the relationship thus established is not just one of reciprocity but one of kinship. Exchange of women expresses that the social relations of a kinship system specify 
that men have certain rights in their female kin and that women do not have the same rights either to themselves or to their male kin. According to Rubin, the social system of kinship therefore necessitates the creation of gender division and the institution of compulsory heterosexuality. It should be made clear that sex gender systems themselves are not inherently good or bad. Rather, it is the formation of the current sex gender system that should be critiqued and changed to have a new sex gender system. To examine the formation of sex and gender, Rubin also approaches the theories of psychoanalysis and specifically she refers to the Oedipal complex. Rubin attempts to rehabilitate Sigmund Freud's understanding of psychoanalysis despite women's and gay movements rejecting them. Rubin feels that the implications of Freudian theory have been radically repressed. In so far as psychoanalysis rationalizes female subordination, it must be critiqued. However, Rubin insists that psychoanalysis contains a unique set of concepts for understanding men, women and sexuality. It is a theory of sexuality in human society. Most importantly, psychoanalysis provides a description of the mechanisms by which the sexes are divided and deformed of how bisexual androgynous infants are transformed into boys and girls. Freud's theorization of the Electra complex was built on the assumption that children were biologically heterosexual and that a child's masculinity and femininity is innate to his or her corresponding sex. The girl's Electra was meant to be the counterpart to the boy's Oedipal. However, with the discovery of the pre-Oedipal phase, it was found that children of both sexes were psychically indistinguishable, which meant that their differentiation into masculine and feminine children had to be explained rather than assumed. Thus, Rubin feels that in the discussions of Triad, gender presentation and sexual preference were not inherited, rather formed in early childhood. Because the mother is the primary caretaker, both young girls and boys see the mother as the object of sexual desire. Rubin argues that Pride was not the biological determinist some people believed him to be. Instead, Pride's theory was about language and the cultural meanings imposed upon anatomy. Penis envy stems not from the desire to possess the genitalia itself, but the social and cultural meanings applied to the penis. Freud's explanation of the Electra complex can also be understood through non-biological means. Without forced heterosexuality, the girl would never have felt that she is less equipped to satisfy the mother. Rubin then turns to Lacan to support her arguments about triad. Lacan sees kinship as the mediating system through which biological sexuality is transformed in the process of entering the cultural order. Through kinship systems, the child learns his place and the world and his allowed objects of desire. Lacan takes the idea of the phallus and uses it to add to the Oedipal complex theory with the castration complex. The position of the phallus evokes differences in status for men and women, for it asserts male dominance. In the pre-Oedipal stage, the child is without a defined sexuality. But after resolving his Oedipal complex, his gender identity is in line with the cultural conventions. Lacan offers a theory of the workings of kinship terms which serve to define the role of each agent or object in the Oedipal drama with symbolic features assigned to objects such as the phallus. The phallus with its symbolic meanings distinguishes men from women and bears the meaning of male dominance. The boy desires his mother but gives her up in exchange for the phallus passed on to him from 
his father. The girl, however, realizes the importance of the palace and denies herself from desiring her mother or any other woman because she sees that only those who possess the palace have a right to do so. She turns, therefore, her desires to her father, who she hopes will give her the palace. He never does and she realizes that the only way she can receive it is through intercourse or a child. Both are given to her by a man and that her castration is a prerequisite to attaining the palace. When she recognizes and accedes to this idea, she has been interpolated into a phallic exchange network. Friot, according to Rubin, asserts that femininity, heterosexuality and desire for motherhood are not innate in women but the result of psychological elements that form in early childhood. Rubin thinks that both Friot and Lacan address the way cultural stereotypes have been mapped onto the genitals. She also notes that psychoanalysts see the creation of femininity in women as an act of psychic brutality based largely on pain and humiliation. Rubin seeks the development of a political economy of sexuality systems, that is to investigate the mechanism which creates and preserves sexual conventions in society. The notions of Levi-Strauss about the family are an additional step, being the manifestation of an artificial division of labor aimed at ensuring heterosexual marriage. Gender for Gail Rubin is a coerced social distinction between sexes. It is the product of sexual social relations. She contends that kinship and marriage are always parts of total social systems and are tied into economic and political arrangements. Kinship relations are based on marriage and they therefore turn males and females into men and women, each an incomplete half that can only be completed by uniting with the other, stressing difference and suppressing resemblance. Rubin concludes the essay by emphasizing the mutual interdependence of sexuality, economics and politics. We can say that the essay's central impulse is to ask the questions of the connections between sex and politics and to learn something about the nature of gender theory itself. In the next module, we will look at the second essay of Gail Rubin, Thinking Sex in Detail. Thank you.